I will work day in and day out to wake up and smell the coffee. The independence case is a powerful one. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order! Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. And in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Curtis, Labour's parliamentary candidate for Milton Keynes North. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. Hi, Will. It's great to have you on, Chris. Um, The first question I'd like to ask is, what made you decide to put your name forward to be Labour's candidate for Milton Keynes North for the next election? One of the most important things for me, you know, is uh, Milton Keynes is the the city I was born in, um, grew up in. Um, and it's a city it's the same age as my mother. So, you know, she wouldn't like me saying this. Yeah, getting on for sixty now. Um, and in that entire time, the city's never the now city um, that made a city last year. City's never had a member of parliament who was born there and grew up there. Now, obviously, that's not the be all and end all, and there's lots of reasons why people don't end up. You know, mm. places end up having MPs for elsewhere. But I think it's important for a, a place as sort of big and grown up as Milton Keynes now and a city of our age to 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 have somebody who you know loves the city grew up in the city and wants to bite for the city and, and i hope to be the mp for milton Keynes that does that mm-hmm. absolutely and um of course be, um before you were uh selected um you're someone uh, and, and you still are of course who's very engaged with opinion polls yeah. with um polling how has that formed your approach to being a candidate? Has that in any way influenced the the way that you approach campaigning? Yeah, I mean the, the other the other factor as well, to, just to link this back to your previous question, that kind of had an impact on this is that like I was finding it incredibly frustrating, like sort of incredibly frustrating to carry on sort of holding this independent pollster role. It's just something that I just didn't feel, you know, I was a, I was, I was a pollster, I went on TV, I talked about the polls, but I did it, you know, tried to do it consistently from an independent um, perspective, not, you know, not partisan, not Labour leaning. Um, and you can argue about how good I was at that. But it was, um, it. I just found a really difficult job because I saw the damage the Tories were doing to my community. I saw this Prime Minister in Boris Johnson um, who was just a complete and utter liar. Mm. Um, and I saw the level of incompetence that was holding our country back. And I just thought, I can't do this anymore. I can't go on TV um, and talk about, you know, oh, how are the Conservatives doing in the polls from an independent perspective? Because I'm just too um, infuriated constantly mm-hmm. at the damage this lot are doing. So I just didn't feel like I could carry on doing that anymore. And I felt like I needed to do something where I where I fought back and standing to be a parliamentary candidate to me seemed like one of the best ways of doing that. I hope that it helps me to see through the noise. Um, you know, you see this all the time in politics where, you know, without, I don't want to be rude at all to my, you know, to have a big, to our fantastic parliamentarians, but quite often they get, they, they sweat the small stuff. They get bogged down in things which I as a pollster don't matter. Like really, really bogged down mm-hmm. things that, Voters out there in the country just don't care about that much. Um, and I hope that the big skill that, you know, being a pollster can give me is realising what really does and doesn't matter to people and focusing on those big things um, that actually change people's lives are actually important to people rather than sweating the small stuff. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, now, in, in terms of your priorities, could you just give an idea uh, to the listeners what kind of things, if, if you're elected to be, um, Milton Keynes North's next mm. MP, you would like to focus on as as a member of Parliament. I mean, yeah. I, to be honest with you, like part of the difficulty at the moment is coming up with a list because <laughs> so much is brought. And this is a really important task, not just for me, but mm. for the next Labour government. God hopes we get it um, after the next election. God knows we need it. Um, but it's really hard to it's really hard to come up with a list. Um, of priorities right now. I mean, the, the, the point about prioritisation is you say these things are more important, these things are less important, but so much is broken. Mm. So much is broken after 13 years of Tory government. There are so many massive problems that need fixing. It does make it incredibly difficult um, to sort of come up with to come up with that prioritisation. I mean, like, well, yeah, having said that, it's also a task that's really important to do. You know, we don't have unlimited resources. We don't have um, unlimited time and energy for the focus on things. So we do need to 
we do need to make sure um, that we that we um, that we do prioritize. I think you know what's probably most important to focus on first. I mean, like clearly, it's most important to focus on fixing the NHS. Yeah, that's got to be in anybody's top three list. Um, and I think about this in Milton Keynes as well, where basically in certain parts of the city, you now can't get a GP appointment. You're now co- almost completely unable to get a GP appointment at the kind of time that people would expect to get one. And there's a GP surgery, which has just stopped taking on new patients out in Olney. Um, so these people would have to travel miles and miles and miles to get a GP appointment two weeks after when they actually need it. Now, that's got to be fixed. Mm-hmm. And that's got to be top of anyone's priority list. The fact that, you know, if, if you have a heart attack, there's a high chance that an ambulance ain't going to turn up in time is not the kind of country that anybody wants Britain to, to be. Um, and, you know, that needs to be fixed. It needs to be it needs to be the, the thing that the next Labour government wakes up in the morning and thinks about first thing and the last thing we think about before we go to bed at night. But I think that's a big priority. Um, another big issue that we have, um, particularly in Milton Keynes North, is um, knife crime. We had a real problem with knife crime, particularly last year in my view uh you know there's there's obviously lots of factors that go into 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 this as an issue but we've had you know massive cutbacks in police funding police numbers and of course what's the thing that gets cut first um when you cut back on police numbers it's community policing Hmm. and you know that kind of community policing is the thing that could have avoided this tragic um loss of life that we've been seeing from the young kids across Milton Keynes tragically mm-hmm. didn't stop. Um, so yeah, I think that's the second thing. And then you know, we also have to think, you know, long term about how we build a far more resilient economy mm-hmm. um, and a resilient country. You know, with the effects of climate change, with the effects of supply chain crises, which are all going to become, which are only going to become more and more regular. Um, we need to make sure that Britain in the future is better able more resilient better able to protect itself against mm-hmm. those kind of shocks because at the moment we're not we're not able to do so as well that means you know making sure that people have secure enough income so that they can take a hit and they can you know it's not be pleasant but at least it doesn't you know drive people into poverty in the way that it does right now it means making sure that we've got more resilient supply chains it means making sure um we're generating more energy here in the uk for example building a lot more wind wind, wind farms and both onshore and offshore, I think trying to build that more resilient um, economy is 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 got to be the, the you know, one of the big lot the biggest long term aim of the next Labour government. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, just on the point of um, policing and knife crime, obviously, as you say, it's a, a, a big issue not just in Milton Keynes but mm. um, across the country as well. I mean, how important do you think um, youth mental health support is as well? An area that has been particularly affected by cuts. And could that, along with you know in- increased funding across the police overall, help cut the the levels of knife crime that we're seeing? I completely think that's true. Um, and again, it, it just like we do, we need to get out of this. Might like particularly from the Cameron era, we as a, as you know, sort of he tried really tried hard to get the country into this mindset of we just need to cut, screw the consequences, and. You know, the, the government is bloated, the government is wasteful, we just need to cut um, because it's spending too much money. And what, you know, what I think we're now realising as a nation is if you suck money out of a system like that, among other things, it ends up costing you loads more money in the long run because you end up having these um, people suffering with mental health conditions. You end up, for example, if you take loads of money out of social care, you have all of these knock-on effects on the, the healthcare service, which means that inevitably, as we're seeing now... Um, it costs a lot more money for the problem only to be fixed in a, in a in a worse way. So, you know, you do need to invest money in order to save money in the long run. And you know, making sure that kids growing up today have got good mental health support. Yeah, every school in the country should have. Every school in the country really should be able to offer good uh, mental health support to their students. They're not able to do so right now. Um, that's really important. Um, and I think that. Um, yeah, if you do that, what does that mean? That means kids are getting a good education. Obviously, they're, they're you know less likely to to go and uh, you know we're less likely to have problems with knife crime and everything else. But it means that they're able to have a good education. It means they're more more likely to be able to build the kind of skills and develop the kind of skills that they need 
um, in order to be able to build that more resilient economy that I was talking about. It means that we are able to build a country that is more resilient against the kind of shocks that I was talking about. So yeah, you know, we do need to be investing in these kind of things because it pays back. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's obviously builds a much better, fantastic country. It's obviously fantastic um, support for people who really need it. But also that means that we can build, uh, yeah, these are the kind of things that pay for them back pay for themselves back 10 20 30 times over um in the coming decades mm -hmm, absolutely and of course one of the other um great issues that a lot of people have is housing and i know that you've um done work on that and you've um been uh, affected yourself by how the the private rental sector is what do you think is needed on a local level to improve housing in milton Keynes, and on on a wider national level as well to to improve the supply of both council housing and um, homes that people can buy and uh, rent through the private rented sector. As, as as a nation, we are going to yeah we 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 are going to have to build more houses. We we do need to come to terms with that, and we need to come up with a plan for how we're going to get more houses built. Now they need to be built in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. They need to be built in a way that means that there's infrastructure in place. Um, they need to be built in a way that doesn't massively upset. Um, local residents we need to think about how we minimize the problems of new house building i think quite often these two things are set up as a dichotomy you either have building more houses uh screw the consequences or um don't build new houses um and actually i'm like build more houses but let's try to mitigate against the consequences of that as much as we possibly can but ultimately as a nation we just need to build more houses uh we 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 do need better better regulation of the private rented sector we need more accountability to private landlords uh, we need better accountability of private landlords who just do not take their job um, seriously. Um, we need tenants to have better ability to stay in tenancies long term. Um, you know, the idea I was speaking to a woman on the doorstep the other day who was being, um, you know, booted out of her private mm -hmm. um, rented accommodation. You know, the, the landlords had seen her mortgage spike and, you know, was, wasn't able to wasn't able to pay for the mortgage so you know needed to yeah need, needed to move her out but that meant that you know she was being removed um from the house she had kids the kids were in a local school the kind of disruption that that causes um is unimaginable and of course that disruption then has not on consequences you know to those kids education to their future career prospects as a consequence um therefore to the wider economy all of these consequences because people don't have stable enough housing situations so you know coming up with a solution to that problem and I, I don't want to pretend that i've got it because you know if you take that example i've just given right what's there's no policy solution to that this woman can't afford to pay her mortgage anymore she has to sell the house it's not an easy question to answer mm. um i mean part of the solution is obviously moving you know and not having this accommodation in the private rent section i think we need more council we do well, we definitely need more council or social housing across the country um but we also need need to try and find solutions to make make sure that um private landlords are held accountable when they're i'm allowed to say taking the piss when they're taking the piss and that happens mm -hmm. all too often it's happened to me as somebody who's you know rented for most of my life um and you know we need to try and add more stability into the system um which just doesn't currently exist absolutely um and of course, alongside housing, in, t in terms of um, growing an a, a economy and ensuring that the yeah. uh, economy is functioning, transport and infrastructure is so important as well. Um, what do you think are the main issues relating to transport into Milton Keynes at the moment? And how do you think of those issues you and the uh, Labour government would be able to, to fix them? kind of links onto the, the problem we were talking about before about priorities right like mm -hmm. uh <laughs> so much that he's fixing our housing system is broken um our nhs has been broken completely by the tories our transport system has been underinvested in i mean one of the things that i would say um about public transport is we probably should be talking more about buses and we should be talking a bit less about trains quite often um more people use you know about i think it's about 50 percent of the you're gonna have to check this but i think it's, it's getting on for 50 percent of the journeys that are taken on public transport method of uh, via public transport are taken on a bus more than are taken on the train more people um use buses than trains every year um particularly those in lower income categories but we spend so much of our energy talking about trains and railways naturally 
um, very little of our energy talking about buses. So I think you know one of the things I really do want to see the next Labour government doing is putting a lot of effort into making sure that our um, bus networks in the various parts of the UK where they still exist, including Milton Keynes, you know, operate in a much more effective, um, efficient way mm -hmm. that is better able to support consumers. And of course, this is like a this is one of those things where you kind of need to get over a bit. You have to invest in order to get over a bit of the hunt. Because one of the big problems we've got, if you take Milton Keynes, for example, is, well, basically no bus route in Milton Keynes makes money. A very small number of bus routes in Milton Keynes um, would actually be profitable without any support because nobody uses the buses. And therefore, because none of them are profitable, and we've sucked so much money out of the system through local council cuts. Um, you know, it becomes harder and harder. Yeah, you, but bus routes get moved, they become less frequent, so fewer people use them, or, yeah, fewer people are reliant on public transport. And then the system, are you getting this spiral of decline? We need to reverse that spiral and get it going back up again. And that is going to mean investing a load of money in, in getting these things running. But it pays off in the long run because then you have more people using buses. More routes become profitable. And eventually these these things end up paying for themselves. But you need to start that spiral upwards. Um, and, you know, a decade and a half nearly of austerity um, has had a real damage on our, on our, on our bus networks. Absolutely. And and do you think as well that in terms of the transition to um, green forms of yeah. transport, we have to take into account, um, obviously, the issue with cars and, and the transition from yeah. um, diesel and petrol cars to electric cars? I mean, yeah. uh, how, how much of an impact do you think that's going to have? And how much do you think that this is looking quite a bit into the long term and we have to uh, have solutions both in the long term but also in the immediate the short term yeah and there's uh, the other thing i was going to say about buses is we uh, you know we need to make them more frequent we need to make them more reliable we need mm -hmm. to make uh you know uh, the better value for money more affordable for everyone um but we also need to make them greener and more environmentally friendly as well we've had um uh, we've had electric buses in Milton Keynes in the past we're hopefully going to have them again in the future we need to be using uh tech like that right across the country um yeah, electric cars are great. You know, uh, uh, my mum's got one. Uh, uh, it works. You know, obviously it doesn't work for everyone. And, you know, but uh, yeah, I, I clearly do this, see this as a future. I, I'm a bit upset as a nation that we, you know, we, we had an opportunity to be, you know, one of the world leaders in making electric cars here. And to be honest with you, we, we didn't use that opportunity as we didn't make the most of that opportunity in a way that we should have done. Um, but, you know, the world is the world is going to transition to electric cars um, over the coming decades. I think that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's you know it's a great opportunity. Yeah, we we you know with it, we had this you know, there was this debate the debate there was you know the the way the world seemed a few you know not not long ago was that you know people weren't you know it maybe wasn't sustainable this idea of a having a personal car and you know as we move towards a zero carbon economy more people would have to use. Um, public transport and I think you know actually lots of people have very strong attachments uh, to the idea of being you know it's, it's a sign of their own freedom to lots of people the idea of being able to have your personal car that you mm. you drive around it's really really important part of lots of people's lives um, and you know the fact that we've now got the kind of tech that means that we can have a zero carbon economy where people can if they want to um, have their own personal car, which they can drive around, um, as you know, or, you know, which they can use. Um, it's fantastic. You know, I think that's mm -hmm. that's that's a fantastic thing. And the fact that yeah, how quickly the tech is developing in order to allow that, you know, the quality of batteries, etc., um, is brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the environment, of course, something that is also important is the amount of land that is green that is not um, used for, for, for housing that um that is in, in some way contributing to helping battle um climate change how important do you think it is that in cities like um, milton Keynes there are areas that there are these green spaces parks yeah. etc that people can go in and, and, and visit yeah really important so um uh, yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, I, Milton Keynes has a bit of a reputation sometimes nationally. Anybody who um, wants to come and visit it um, is always surprised. Um, when I've taken friends of mine from London up recently you know, to, to come and campaign, 
um, for me in the city, always shocked at just how beautiful and green the city is. You know, we because you know, it was because of the way it was built, the way it was designed. It was built in a way that the vast majority of people um, live incredibly close to a green space that they can use. We have wonderful lakes, wonderful wildlife areas um, that people can explore. Um, I think that's really important, right? Like, mm -hmm. and you know, as the city grows, as more houses are are put in, and 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 you know, more more people move to Milton Keynes. I think it's really, really important uh, that we keep that ethos. We keep there being green spaces um, that people can people can visit and people can enjoy. Do you think that in in terms of the um, perception of Milton Keynes, you mentioned it that that is going to be important for you if if you are elected as um, MP for Milton Keynes North to be able to put a per perhaps much more positive and, and, and open uh, vision of Milton Keynes out there for people around the rest of the country who do have perhaps a bit of a preconception about it and, and act very much as an ambassador to be able to say, well, you know, you might have a, a, a preconception about Milton Keynes, but actually come here and visit the city and you will see how different it is from what you might think it's like. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anybody, anybody listening to this right now who ever considers making some sarky comment about him, get in touch. My DMs on Twitter are open. Get in touch with me. I will give you a personal tour and I will prove you wrong. The city is remarkable and it is beautiful. You know, we have low air pollution. We have wide access to fantastic green and open spaces. We've got a stupidly large number of trees. It's incredibly efficient to get around. We've got a a dynamic economy and a resilient economy with good access um, to jobs. God, God knows, God knows, the city's got its problems, just like anywhere in the country. We talked about the difficulty getting GP appointments at the moment. You know, there are difficulties with growing pains as the city's been growing, and you know, the hospital is necessarily big enough to go. There are issues with the city. God knows there are, but it is also one of the most stunning and beautiful places on earth. And I will challenge anybody. Um, who feels the need to criticise it? So come to the city. Let me show them around, and I will prove to them that their their misconceptions are completely wrong. Uh, just thinking about the um, the, the the wider future uh, for a moment. Obviously, you're you're going to be standing as, as the Labour candidate at the next election, whenever that is, um, and that's an election that, based on the um, polling, the Labour Party looks as if it's going to win, and perhaps win by a, a significant margin. Looking at the immediate aftermath of that election, if Labour is to win, win and to, to form the next government, what do you think nationally um, Labour's priorities are? Do you think that there's anything that is in any way different from the um, priorities that you're focusing on locally, or do you think that they're, they're broadly the same? Well, I mean, I'd, well, let, well, let me let me start by rejecting the premise of your question. Uh, <laughs> there is, I say this, I say this as somebody who has been a pollster for nearly a decade, I have seen time and time again how Labour has risen up in the polls midterm only for that sort of comfortable polling lead to completely evaporate by election day. <laughs> um, there is not a bone in my body and there not should be a bone in anybody's body in the entirety of the Labour Party that is in any way complacent right now. Uh, if we stop trying and rest on our laurels, we will lose the next election and we'll have five more years of the Tories trashing everything. We need to work hard every single day to get out there, to get campaigning, to get our message out to voters, to make sure that our policies and our priorities are completely in line um, with the voters that we need to win at the next election, not in line just with the members of the Labour Party. Um, and I'll, you know, I keep making that point um, until it, you know, those sentences I find them painful to say because I've said them too much. But I, honestly, it is such an important point to make because um, this country cannot afford. It, we just cannot afford five more years of Tory Tory rule. We, we just, you know, I'm I'm incredibly. I've got a 93 year old grandmother. I'm scared every day that something's going to happen to her, um, and the ambulance isn't going to turn up. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know what it's going to be like after five more years of the Tory government. I'm not sure the NHS is going to be able to cope. Like, it's a real responsibility on us and the Labour Party to make sure we're up to the job of governing this country in a couple of years' time and making sure we get rid of this absolute useless Tory government that's currently driving our country into the ground. But putting that aside to the minute, you know, let's assume <laughs> let's assume that we do that. Let's assume that we don't rest on our laurels. Let's assume that we aren't complacent. Let's assume that um, the British public trust us 
with their vote after the next election. Um, yeah, I'd, the, the, the priorities point is the same nationally as it as it is locally in that it's very hard. It's really important, but really hard to prioritise when so much is going wrong. I think the NHS has got to be really high up the list, as I said. Um, I think however difficult it is, quite often we have to um, focus quite early on on the things that are going to... Um, that are going to pay back, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So you have you have to really focus hard on doing the things first that are going to grow the economy um, nationally, uh, and uh, you're going to have the biggest positive economic impact because you can then use the money from that to solve all of the other problems as well. Um, yeah, and this one, did you ever play The Sims as well? Yeah. So you know, like you know, if you send your sim to work, mm-hmm. um, and if you sent them to work with all of their like green bars full. Um, and they had, you know, they had all of the skills that they needed on the little, the little blue bar screen. If they had all of that, they got promoted. They did well at yep. work. We were incredibly successful, right? Basically, my sort of analogy for what's wrong with our economy right now: after 13 years of Tory government, too many people don't have full green bars either because they don't have the health support they need, the mental health support they need. They don't have good, stable, secure housing. They're not given. Few people in this country are given access to skills and education. That they need we need to fix those problems and in doing so you know we're going to grow the economy and then we're going to be able to spend all of the money yeah you know, we're going to have a lot more money available to spend on the things that we'd also like to be spending money on um you know that, that are therefore a bit further down the priority list um and you know what do i think most things are then i think you know we need to be we obviously need to be fixing our nhs supporting mental health support i also think one of the big things on this list is childcare. um it's such a damaging impact on our economy and on people's lives, on the workforce, to not have to have incredibly expensive childcare in Britain. Um, I think the next Labour government has to have a really bold policy um, on bringing down cost, costs and increasing quality of, of childcare. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you for coming on the podcast, Chris. I have one final question for you. Uh, we're recording this podcast on... Um, Valentine's Day, it's a very important yeah. date in the year for so many people. And so my final question to you is this. If you have someone who is your um, political hero or political idol through a, throughout history um, and you had to give them a Valentine's card, who would you give the Valentine's card to and what would it say? Oh, God. <laughs> I haven't really thought of, like, political heroes. Um... I don't know. I genuinely don't know. I mean, like, you sort of like, the problem is if you haven't thought of this question, you go to like the easy answers. Um, and that's not particularly interesting, right? Like, I mean, obviously, I think, you know, Atley was fantastic and the kind of reforms he brought in after 40, bold reforms that he brought in after 45 that have had such a positive impact on this country over the past decades. Um, they've been incredible but then like you know that's need you, you want to pick someone that's neat like ultimately the best way of answering this question is to try and think of somebody niche mm-hmm. um, that you think you know really symbolizes the kind of things that you the kind of qualities um, uh, that you that you value um, I'm not sure I just can't I'm just struggling to think of an answer <laughs> could I come back to you on that like I just <laughs> honestly you just uh I have I have many political heroes, um, but I've also got many political villains, including the last three Tory Tory prime ministers who I thought were last five Tory prime ministers who have just driving this country into the ground. So I'm guessing that none of them would receive a, a Valentine's card from you. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for coming on the podcast, Chris. It's been great to speak to you. Um, for people who are interested in your campaign and want to find out more about um what you're doing where should they go to find out more about your campaign and 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 more about you yeah if you google chris curtis milton Keynes, my website will come up you can get in touch i am on twitter um if you search for me my gms are always open you can message if anybody listening to your podcast will fancy is coming up and campaigning Mm -hmm. anybody is welcome um as i say we can't be complacent god knows we need to get these tories out um and i'll take all the help i can get (laughs) in order to to support me in doing so. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you once again for coming on the podcast. No, thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. 
If you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam, and Amazon Music. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook, Debated Podcast, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, whether about appearing on an episode of the podcast, or commenting on an episode that you've listened to, you can do so at thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.